All right, where is our first question? Yes. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we're all looking for hope here, and it is wonderful to hear hopeful sounds. What I did want to ask, though, is that everyone sounds, everyone sounds no, we closer. Hear you. There you go. Everyone sounds very much like an ethical humanist, mm -hmm. which is wonderful. But there, as we all know, almost every religious movement has a strand whose you know, precepts are very much against equality. And in fact, your large segments of people globally would feel that equality is something that God, is not God's plan and that you are going against a, a religious uh, dogma that could condemn you to God knows what. That was not an intended pun. What do you see as an angle to I don't know, challenge that. How would you bring in faith-based groups that would ever come close to the notions of equality and justice that you're uh, aspiring to, that we all are? Who wants to take that question on? I'll have a swing at that. I mean, I really think that things are uh, changing and that actually often uh, more secular liberals don't appreciate the degree to which there has been a marked change in among conservative evangelicals. Uh, 10, 15 years ago, essentially humanitarianism tended to be a liberal constituency in the US uh, on the coast. And Jesse Helms famously was said that foreign aid is money down a rat hole. Uh, Tom DeLay talked about uh, foreign aid putting Ghana over grandma. Um, that kind of reflected the state of politics then. That has changed. I mean, it has been transformed. I mean, one of the people who has pushed the hardest on uh, the well, genocide, trafficking, whatever, is Sam Brownback, who is, you know, I agree with on absolutely nothing, but he has done heroic work on these issues, very genuine heavy lifting on these issues. Um, the, uh, Bush's best uh, legacy was PEPFAR, the AIDS program, and uh, that was responding to evangelical pressures. Today, when I look at sex trafficking, there is terrific work being done by liberal, feminist, secular groups. There's also terrific work being done by conservative, evangelical groups. And I think that one reason more isn't accomplished on some of these issues is that there is this incredible suspicion that goes both ways that makes it difficult to cooperate. The language is different. I mean, as we talk about prostitutes or sex workers, and, and there are you know, all kinds of very deep-rooted uh, suspicions. But I think that uh, we have seen some uh, on, on AIDS, on malaria, on trafficking, um, not yet on maternal mortality, although there is potential. It's growing. It's beginning. It's growing, yeah. um, And uh, there, you know, that, that, that is something that both sides should, uh, should really try very hard because we want to accomplish an awful lot more uh, if that does happen. One of the, uh, we looked at, at efforts, social movements that worked uh, for if we're going to have this guy. And one of the ones that really struck us the most was the British uh, uh, abolitionist movement beginning in the 1780s. Uh, it was incredibly successful. I mean, the best model of a real humanitarian effort. And one of the things that made it work was that it did bridge the entire spectrum from uh, kind of leftists who were sympathetic to the, to the French Revolution to uh, evangelicals on the right. And that's what gave it this force that ultimately led to the abolition of slavery. Diana. I, I, I wanted to add to that, and I wanted to tip my hat to Sister Claire of the Sisters of the Good Shepherd, who's a wonderful, wonderful advocate for women's rights. I think we have to be careful when we talk about religion, as you described it, and women's rights, because very often it's not necessarily religion, the dogma itself, it's the interpretation, the political interpretation of religion. You know, as Gloria Steinem always says, if it happens to men, it's political, but if it happens to women, it's cultural. And I think a lot of the <laughs> systems have used religion as a way to, um, to oppress women. So if you look at female genital mutilation, where there is a lot of um, misinterpretation of the Quran, where it, it's not anywhere in the Quran that that girl should be cut at all, um, polygamy. You know, if, if, or, or, even, or even, you know, the Catholic Church. Um, if you went back to the sayings of Jesus, he, is, he was for equality. So I think when you look at religion, you also have to 
remember that you, these are political institutions that want to further a particular system. And so, and, and, but also more importantly is that you have people from those communities who, who, who do follow those religions, who have really challenged very successfully their religious leaders um, into changing their, their minds and reinterpreting the, the true word of God, whatever that God you describe as. Heavy. Um, let's go up to the top back there. Uh, yes. Um, one thing, it took 60 years for the United Nations to finally decide that um, uh, there's war, you know, that women should be, uh, violence against women should be considered a war crime. And they just got it, UNIFEM just got it, you know, in the declaration. I don't know how many years it'll take before they act on it. Um, but that's something, it's, you know, that it took 60 years uh, for them to pass it. And the other thing is, the whole idea of war and the economics for men, you know, that the fact that there's so much unemployment in the world and it's getting worse here too, and how men then wind up going in, in, you know, into the military, I don't know if they do it, you know, because, uh, for survival, but this whole issue of war and, and uh, you know, uh, the issues about women's violence, and also in this country now, they're having more domestic violence as women keep their jobs and men are losing their jobs. So these are counter forces. Unfortunately, we came to maybe some enlightenment, but now the economy is shifting a lot of things in, in a very uncomfortable men-woman dynamic. <laughs> so do you have a, a question? Yes, I'm wondering what you think about that in terms of the dynamic of how the economics now may, of the whole world and, and depression uh, may you know, economic depression may hold back some of the things that you're hopefully talking about. Bill, yes. Uh, th this is something I think you're exactly right. And, uh, the official unemployment statistics in this country and everywhere dramatically understate the problem. Our best analysis is that we have 80 million full-time equivalent jobs missing in the U.S. economy. And there is no way that older people, people with disability, women, young people, minorities, immigrants, people, I mean, almost 40% of the potential workforce doesn't have a job. Now, there is no way that we're going to have any of those groups do well until we structurally change that issue, which we could do. You take off payroll taxes, you put taxes on natural resources, that's a 30% shift in the relative price of those two. It's worth about 40 million jobs, full-time equivalent jobs with no debt. Now, if we did that, an awful lot of women would have jobs, a lot of the glass ceilings would go away, a lot of young people of both genders. And this is an example of how we all need to work together to deal with the large structural problems that's holding everyone down. And of course, if women are held down more than most people in much of the world, uh, they suffer more. Um, it, 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 that, so, but if we don't solve that problem, the groups are always going to be fighting one another. Uh, in World War II, we increased the workforce by 40% and the average work week by 20% in the first two years of the war, and there was no supply shortage because Rosie the Riveter and you know older people, they came into the workforce, and what happened after the war? They were all sent away. But we, this is craziness. Mm -hmm. you, know, you, you make a really good point. Mm -hmm. um, yes, all the way in front. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so if you want to stand. I can probably be loud enough. Okay. <laughs> When um, she's coming. I've got a teacher voice. So I, okay. <laughs> I, I want to, uh, this probably fits it in with everything you've been doing about education, but social class issues. I can remember going to a conference 25 years ago, and one of the conferees said, you know, we, as a conference, we're the ladies, <laughs> you know, with the, who tend to have paler skin. Meanwhile, at home, the work is being done by women from Latin America or from, uh, you know, who have darker skins, they're doing the real work of our households. And all these social class issues, which obviously fit in with education and everything else, but I'd like to hear what you have to say about those. Well, I was really thrilled when um, Julia Louise Dreyfus won her Grammy, her Emmy Award. I, you may, maybe it, like, but when she won her Emmy Award for this new show, which was like two years ago, 
the women that she thanked, actually, she said, and I want to thank Rosa Maria. <laughs> she didn't give the last name. She should have. Well, we don't know if they were Maybe with not. papers or without. Yeah, right. So who knows? But she was like, and I want to thank Rosa Maria and Juanita because without them, I couldn't be here. And I was like, oh my God, somebody acknowledged yeah. this reality that is the silent. Well, you know, we got, Lou Dobbs is gone, so that's. <laughs> <laughs> at, at every chance, just a little dig for Lou Dobbs. <laughs> um, we need a, oh, so your question. So, oh, I just want to hear some response to this, these issues of social class and inequality among women, you know, uh, women, women, some women, you know, serving other women so that those women can allow other women to, you know, I've seen a lot of that in my life. And Do you want to talk about that, Anna? Uh, yes, I, I think that I some, somehow alluded already to that. Uh, yes, inequalities are not only among men and women or among countries, but within uh, women there are huge inequalities that relate uh, to education level, to socioeconomic level, to location, to access to uh, the goods women need to develop themselves. And those inequalities are particularly huge among poorer women. I'm not so familiar with the situation in the U.S. because we mostly work internationally. But in the countries where we work, uh, we see that every day. I mean, uh, the poorer women are, the more unequal they are, even within that uh, social stratum. Uh, so that makes a, a very big difference in terms of, of women's health. Uh, let me give you an example. Uh, we talked before about abortion. Even in countries where abortion is illegal, women with resources, both financial and information, manage to access safe services and they don't die as a result of an abortion, uh, again, even if illegal. While women who don't have those resources in the same country with the same legal framework uh, face awful consequences. So I couldn't agree with you more. Uh, that's totally true. Now, someone uh, once characterized it as the developing world within the developed world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Although, I mean, one of the things that I think is, is you know, again, on that very human, what can I do, I just think that um, talking to these women who are the invisible employees and may even be your employees, but talking to them as a woman and understanding what their needs may be as women um, is central. I mean, just slipping it also one of the realities that we face in this country, Latina teenagers now have the highest rate of attempted suicide of all. So you're, t and this is a story that has not been reported. I'm just waiting for the right moment to make it big because it's a huge story that deals with identity issues, self-hatred, et cetera, et cetera. But we don't talk about this because it's somehow, you know, the silent, invisible members of our society who are, in fact, going to grow up and be part of our society. Um, other questions? Yes, right there in the middle. I'm making it real difficult. Yes, you. Can they you use the mic? Huge, they had a big debate about how their real news is shown on television and the gore and the horror of what goes on is in your face and you can see it. And Nick, when you were talking in Oprah and the pictures that were shown on that particular show and the man with the tears afterwards made this a reality. And I wonder if all of you who do do media, what are you doing or anything, if your words, Nick, could come to life on a screen, um, what power that would have for people to be informed and perhaps be out there doing more? It's definitely true that images uh, and especially uh, video, um, you know, build empathy and make people care in a way that printed words just don't. Um, Having said that, I think that one of the problems uh, in the way we cover a lot of humanitarian crises, and whether it's we as journalists or, or humanitarians generally, is that we often focus on the really terrible things that are happening um, and leave people without a sense of hope. Uh, in trying to, uh, after I was really frustrated, uh, frankly, a few years ago, trying to get people to, to more concerned about Darfur, uh, 
uh, especially, um, remember in, in New York, that was right when Pale Male, the, um, the red-tailed hawk was, and every New Yorker was so concerned about Pale Male being homeless, and meanwhile, you know, Darfur was, was not, and so that led me to the work of some social psychologists who look at basically why we care about issues, what builds empathy, and there's a film called Paul Slovic, in particular, a, a, a professor of psychology, who has done some interesting experiments in this, and uh, one of his conclusions is that it's about <coughs> storytelling, about individuals. We don't care about the group, we care about the individual, which is somewhat intuitive. But the other is that people want to be a part of something successful. So they're much more likely to engage in some kind of intervention if it's going to make a real difference in a trajectory um, for a group. They don't, they don't, for example, want to support a um, one of the... the Questions is when you would you would you support a, um, a, a, a clean water station that would save X number of lives, I know 500 lives, and people will support it in a camp of 1,000 people where it would save half the people. They wouldn't support it in a camp of 100,000 people where it'll you know, save only half of one percent. And in general, that seems to reflect this broader truism: people want to be a part of something inspiring, positive you know, better outcomes. And I think sometimes the humanitarian organizations, and maybe we as journalists, focus on these terrible tragedies in ways that, frankly, psych people out and turn people off. And there's a very delicate balance between, you know, something that Cheryl and I struggle with in writing Half the Sky, in telling stories that reflect all the brutality out there, and yet showing yeah. that change is possible, that one can uh, can bring about a truly positive, inspiring transformations. And I think that is something that we are still uh, all struggling with, partly because, frankly, as Cheryl said earlier, we don't typically have the marketing savvy that is just natural and intuitive if for, for Coca-Cola or Pepsi or any other company. You know, one of the things that, um, <clears throat> because uh, the work that I do at, at now looking critically at so much stuff that's happening around the country and around the world is that you do feel completely beaten down sometimes. Um, one thing that I love to do is actually talking to people that I'm with right here in my community. Again, the people who maybe work for you or who are cleaning your office or, you know, who knows? I mean, just reading all of the stories, they could be any of them and we don't, I just think that that human connection is so important and sometimes reveals things. For us as New Yorkers, we have such extraordinary access to things. When we were looking for somebody to do a voiceover for our documentary around child marriage, um, and we had been to Niger and we were looking for a young African woman to do a voiceover, we were having a hard time finding the right voice and my producer, I said, oh, well, I said, I live in West Harlem. It's Little Senegal, don't worry, I'll, you know, I'll just go to the first, restaurant, you know, and so I got out of my subway stop on 116th Street, there's a restaurant there, I went upstairs to the restaurant, there was, it's an African restaurant, beautiful young woman, you know, in her 20s, early 20s, uh, and I said, she was a waitress, and I said, would you, you know, I'm, I was just off the street, I was like, hi, I'm Maria Hinojosa, we're looking for voices, do you think you might be interested in, she was like, absolutely, I, of course, I would love to do a voiceover, I, yes, I, I, I'm a student, et cetera, et cetera. Then she asked, so, you know, after a few minutes, so what's the topic of the documentary? I said, well, it's a documentary about child marriage. And her body went into just a complete, she just contorted. Mm -hmm. And I took her arm and I said, don't, don't tell me. Are you, were you, you know, and I didn't even finish. She said, I left everything in my home in Gambia. I ran away from my father, from his four wives, where I was tortured because they wanted me to be a child, mar a child bride. And I knew that I was not gonna, I, I was gonna be a student. And she, you know, ended up uh, at some point probably being trafficked along the way, but is now, you know, here and, and through, she was at a UN event that we did around the issue of the documentary, and now she's at community college and she's working with a local organization. One woman, her name is Salima, and she was my neighbor essentially, in New York. So I love the fact that we make these connections and we help people, but sometimes us New Yorkers who walk 15% faster than anybody else, whatever, <laughs> they're here. 
I never forget when I got into a cab and we drove by a protest around Darfur. And my cab driver said, that's where I'm from. And I was like, what? He's like, I'm Darfurian. There's a Darfurian community in Brooklyn. I'm like, oh my god. So that is one little thing that I like to say. Make the people, and especially the women who we live with here in our city, make them feel visible and heard. Because many of them, we may be surprised, have the same stories as the women in this book. Um, another question. <laughs> All the way in the back. <laughs> I'm making my poor microphone guys run. Um, hey, this is amazing. Um, so I work with young girls in a program called Girls on the Run International. And one of the things that we talk about with the kids, and I'm on the ground running, so I work with third to eighth grade girls in North America now. And one of the things we talk about with the girls is where they get their power. And we talk about power with a little p, which is when you get your power from someone else. In other words, you sort of determine your own power based on someone else's impression. Are you, you know, utilizing, are you using your sexuality to get what you want, or are you owning it? And, you know, then we talk about power with a big P, which is, you know, the source of your power, which is more internal and really helping the kids kind of focus on their gifts. And, you know, if they can find those gifts and utilize those, then they're really finding their internal power. And I guess I'm so confused about where girls and women really get their power. And I would like to ask the panelists, if you were talking, to an eight-year-old little girl, what would you, how would you tell her to find that power? Where should she look? How should she really, really tap into that? I, I'll tell you as the mom of an 11-year-old, um, the one thing that we do is we talk about everything at all times. Nothing is off, you know, and the, that's why I was really angry at Elliot Spitzer because I would have had the conversation with her about prostitution when it naturally came up. Unfortunately, he, you know, but it did open the conversation around sex trafficking and being careful and all of these kinds of issues. So I tell her to understand that she um, has a powerful voice inside, that she needs to use that, but I see her struggling with it and she's going through adolescence and I see that she likes a boy, you know, and I'm. I'm working so hard at helping her to understand her power. I don't think that there is one answer. I think it's a continual conversation. But at least opening up the, the dialogue so we can talk about it. Um, just another quick little aside uh, on popular culture. I'm watching a television show called Glee, um, which I think is pretty amazing. But there is, for all kinds of reasons, I also love Ugly Betty, but this particular show, there is, <coughs> the top cheerleader, cheerleading captain who ends up pregnant, okay? She's, so she's the perfect, you know, blonde-haired, blue-eyed cheerleading captain. Her parents are, you know, the um, conservatives in the chastity movement and all this, and she ends up pregnant. Well, I paused the television and I said, okay, listen, to my kids, my 14-year-old son and my 11-year-old girl, I said, listen. And they were like, mom, don't pause the TV, come on, not a lecture, not a lecture now. And I was like, you need to hear this. There's no reason why she has to be pregnant, why she ended up pregnant. There's no reason. And I gave a little bit more of a lecture, but I basically ended up saying, you must use condoms. And my kids are like, mom, <laughs> you heard it from me. We need to have this. We need to be able to. And I said, and plus, if she ended up pregnant, we live in a country where having an abortion is a legal right for her. And I know my daughter was kind of like, hmm? you know, 11 years old. So I guess what I'm saying is, for me, what works is the dialogue, that we have to talk about these things. We have to talk constantly. And letting her know that she has to find her, her mentors, maybe not just me, but other women, um, not necessarily her girlfriends, okay, who can be really good at tearing her down, but other women that she can see as mentors. Okay. Just... Well, I, I... First of all, I, I, this is a wonderful program. As you know, it's part of the Ashoka community, so we're thrilled you're here. Uh, I, I, I think this is just the most fundamental question that everyone who cares about any young person uh, has got to ask. Uh, ultimately, you want that person, your young friend, child, nephew, just friend, to give themselves power. Uh, that's the barrier that holds most people back. 
And uh, to do that, the skills I referred to, empathy, you gotta start that very young, teamwork, leadership, change making, that's very much the work. And I would argue it's much more the work than, capture, than learning knowledge. Um, you, you can't just learn the rules and be a good person anymore, that doesn't work. The rules don't cover, they cover less and less of life. And so how do you help that happen? And, and this is just, uh, every parent has got to do the work Maria was saying, but we've also got to change the youth cultures, school by school, neighborhood by neighborhood. If you go to an, a, one of the very good elite schools, it's very different. If you go to Andover, there is a student organization for every nine students, and they're genuinely run by the students. Now, you can't come out of that place without thinking you're skilled, because you are. You've been recruited, come and join our organization, use the services of the student organizations, you're just learning. Now, think about the normal elementary, middle, high school. Does that happen? No. When is the chance for a young person to actually be powerful? Uh, in the class, uh, sports, who runs the sports, if there is sports? Who runs whatever remains of the student organizations? There's nothing, and so the youth culture itself doesn't have that power. Um, and so we've got to change that. And you know, this, this is, you know, I'll just give you another story. This is a 12-year-old uh, a from Utah. She was told she couldn't be an astronaut, and she had the internal unreasonableness to say, well, that's ridiculous. And so she created something called AstroTots. And she organized other people, and there's courses training young girls to, you know, how to be prepared to, prepare to be an astronaut. Well, she is going to be one powerful person, and all the kids she's working with are practicing empathy, teamwork, and, and they're getting the idea they can do this. You know, we need those few young people to do the hard work of tipping her school, her neighborhood. And boy, we should be behind them. All it takes is two or three in a school per year to do that, and you can tip the whole culture. And this is just profoundly important. So parenting, changing the culture of the schools. I mean, this is, if we don't do this, we will be Detroit and not Silicon Valley as a country because we won't have a population that's able to function in the, in the world we're going to be in in 10 or 15 years. And it really won't take 50 years. Virtually all the major industrial cities that were booming 50 years ago, where are they today? They, they missed the last transition. And this transition is going faster and faster. And so Girls on the Run is making a big contribution to that, and I just think this is something each of us really has to work on and can work on. We don't have to wait for 15 other people. Does anybody else want to no, move on? Let me uh, uh, add something about education, which also goes to the question you raised about social class, that um, you know, one of the global injustices is that the best way to overcome poverty, the best way to overcome differences in social class, whether in this country or in other countries, is precisely education. And yet both in this country and in other countries, invariably uh, the best education goes to those who already have every advantage. And those who precisely need that escalator are the ones who are denied a good education. And uh, there's, no, I mean, there's no silver bullet in education, in, in development, or fighting terrorism extremism, whatever, nothing works perfectly. But education is the single thing that tends to have the best record, and it works better than a lot of other things do. And uh, I was just uh, you know, thinking when Obama made his, uh, his Afghanistan speech that you know, in the long run, one of the real problems is that the people who've invested in education in that region are, frankly, Wahhabi extremists who have set up a string of madrasas in Pakistan. They've, they, they see the transformative power of education. They put their money where their mouth is. They uh, provide free lunches to attract people to madrasas. And, for, you know, the, and then that creates this sort of track which tends to uh, drive these people toward a more extremist future, create social networks for them. Uh, they're very smart social entrepreneurs. Um, and we haven't shown that same commitment to education that a bunch of uh, medieval misogynists have, uh, and it would cost 
you know, about less than one day of our of the Afghan, of the more extra Afghan deployment to provide alternatives to all of these kids who were going to madrasas in Pakistan and uh, wouldn't be a quick fix, but over time would certainly make Pakistan and the entire region a far more promising place and make us more secure here in New York as well. Hi, I want to thank all the panelists for being here today and for all of the great work in Half the Sky. Um, my question is to follow up on one of the ideas you proposed about education, teach the world, actually, and how myself and other young people can sort of take the ball and run with this idea to make this program a reality. In the book, we talked about the idea that Justice Teach for America has really been so successful in galvanizing young people who want to do something that if there were a similar program, Teach for the World, that would be give people, young people a chance to volunteer for a year, probably teaching English, um, uh, shorter time period than Peace Corps, um, uh, but, you know, but sort of easier to mesh between a year of college and a year of grad school, whatever it might be. Um, that uh, this it would certainly be a great foreign aid program, but above all, the, obviously the biggest beneficiaries would be those Americans who have the chance to participate. Um, the, uh, you know, the, um, the problem is that, you know, I mean, everybody thinks it's a great idea except for the people who will actually legislate and pass the, pass the, pass the legislation. Uh, I don't, I mean, I, I don't know how realistic it is to imagine that, um, that Washington would uh, take this on, um, you know, it sure seems like a, a great idea to me, but uh, there haven't, we haven't exactly been fielding, you know, fending off uh, phone calls from interested congressmen who want to introduce such bills. So any I sense mean, that- tag on, t tag on to the Peace Corps, a modernized version of the, of the Peace okay, Corps. Okay, but any sense that with Hillary Clinton there? Well, I mean, Obama had, in his campaign, he talked about this yeah. the $2 billion global education fund and uh, since then, it's kind of, it's there's been utter silence. Now, it's sort of understandable that if you're fighting a uh, healthcare battle, you don't want to have a lot of other issues on the agenda. But you don't get the sense that, I mean, Hillary Clinton, I think, does really, I think she genuinely cares a great deal about development. Um, uh, having said that, it took, it took the administration forever to come up with an administrator for USAID. Uh, you don't get the sense that, development issues are absolutely at the, at the fore. And this Global Education Fund, which was such a great idea, has you know, just been, uh, seems to have been more or less forgotten. So we'll see. Anna? Yeah, uh, we are also waiting to see what happens in the current administration in our field. But there are some good news. I'm, I'm pretty optimistic. Only uh, yesterday, the changes to the large HIV AIDS program that President Bush started, the one that someone mentioned before, the acronym is PEPFAR. The changes to that program were announced and they, the changes are wonderful. Those, the, they are exactly the changes we were waiting for. I mean, uh, women are all over the place, abstinence only programs are out. Uh, the, uh, programs are all based on evidence and all, uh, all we know that works. Uh, so that's an important change. Uh, I think that, yes, it took them a long time to appoint the, the administrator for USAID, but I think it's a good choice as far as we know. And probably it wasn't in their hands. I mean, the, maybe it took so long not because they didn't push it, but because of whatever system, convoluted and crazy system they have in play. So uh, uh, the, we, we still need to see how much money there's going to be for family planning, but apparently there's going to be much more money than we used to have. Uh, so uh, we are all cautious. We are all waiting to see what happens next. And we are, many of us are very disappointed with the decisions on Afghanistan. And I couldn't agree with you more when, with what you wrote in your column today. Uh, but uh, on the other hand, many good things are happening, and I think that the fact that Hillary is there makes a difference, and Milan Verbeer uh, will also hopefully make a difference. So somehow the, 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 the current timing is much, much better than in, I, I, I shouldn't say ever, but uh, in, it's the best time in many, many years, and not only here in the U.S., 
Also, there are big commitments from the UK government to increase the money for a maternal mortality, for the fight against maternal mortality and family planning. The Nordic countries are also adding much more money. So somehow I, I see that tipping point or change about to happen. Uh, we need to be ready to seize the opportunity and use that momentum uh, in a productive fashion. Yes. Uh, I'd like to pick up on points that Cheryl and Nick and Phil have all made on another aspect of the media, and that's, uh, and that's on the uh, looking at media as entertainment. Uh, one of the success stories of developing the emotional connection, the empathy, has been putting uh, topics such as using condoms and safe sex into telenovelas and soap operas around the world. Very low cost to the advocates, but I wonder if, if you just use this as a time to connect of where that builds the emotional connection, tells the story persuasively, and how that fits into your kinds of marketing plans. I'm hoping to star in a telenovela very soon. <laughs> <laughs> You may not know that Now on PBS actually has been canceled, mm. so we're going off the air at the end of April. So I will be looking for work. Um, so if you know of any telenovelas who want, <laughs> I'm, just, I'm not kidding about the cancellation, but I don't know about the <laughs> soap opera work. Um, soap operas? Anybody? Entertainment, entertainment world. Uh, well, you gonna get? Uh, go, go ahead. ahead no. Go ahead. Go ahead. Well, I was gonna say first of all, soap operas are just extremely effective. Yeah. I mean, I mean, we should. That should be our campaign, yeah. <laughs> soap operas, because actually there's a study done in, in India that uh, showed that um, when you put television, you know, in the homes of some of these villager villages and villagers who, you know, we are trying to change and trying to uplift the status of women, um, it's remarkable. It, it's the equivalent of five years of education, six months. I mean, just because, you know, they see the men and the women who are watching the soap operas see role models. They see women going out the door on their own without having to get permission from their husband. They see women making choices, which is a novelty to them, and they're wondering, hmm, how come <laughs> on TV, this important, very, this important box, uh, we see women actually doing things. So soap operas are extremely powerful, so if you can sort of stick a few really important messages in the commercials. Diana? Yeah. Yeah, I would, I would definitely echo what Cheryl says. It, it really is a, a dream for, um, for advocates like ourselves to, to really have these, these packages. They're multimedia packages because you know, the women see themselves. It's, it's aspirational for, for, for them. But what we're trying also to work on is, is destroy the, all the negative media that really affects women and girls, and particularly um, you know, the commodification, pornification, objectification of of uh, girls in particular. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so what we're looking for, I don't know if Ashoka has identified them, is really a youth movement that really challenges the media structure in, in really, we're talking about equality here, about not dehumanizing half the sky, and yet half of our television is about dehumanizing. Yeah, um, and you know, one <laughs> thing we haven't talked about is, is the, the sex industry and, and the, the pornography industry that is a mega multi-billion dollar industry that has a lot of influence on the media. And so again, I think that is an impediment to equality that we haven't even started to tackle. And, and as moms, you know, when yes. you're raising a daughter in this country, the porn, I hadn't heard that word pornification, but that's exactly the word. Um, you know, when Dancing with the Stars is featuring a, a Playboy model as some kind of mm -hmm. a star with fake breasts, you know, again, great conversation for my daughter, but it's more the message that it's, that's being sent out there. So, um, yeah. Um, We've got, what, five more minutes? One more I question. Want, one, one more question. question. And then I'm going to ask everybody on the panel to just leave one thing that we all, instead of feeling overwhelmed, um, that we can all feel empowered by, and something that we can all do in this room. So last question is going to be right here. Sir. Sir. <laughs> uh, thank you for letting men ask questions. Uh, Judging from the temper of uh, the so-called debate on medical care these days, uh, the, the, most of Americans who are not New Yorkers do not think that we have anything to learn from the way other nations do anything. That's a great weakness. I'd be interested in any testimonies that some of, on this panel may have as to what they have learned from somebody in a culture different from the one in which they were raised. <laughs> 
around that. Well, okay. anybody? In healthcare specifically, or no, more? No, no, anything. Women's equality. Well, um, I mean, Half the Sky was in many ways inspired by what we saw in East Asia. That we were fascinated by issues of global poverty and why, how East Asia had been so successful in overcoming it. And each country had a somewhat different economic model. South Korea was more uh, heavy industry, uh, Hong Kong light industry, some more planning oriented, some more market oriented. But the common thread was that they took rural women who had traditionally contributed negligibly to the economy, educated them, built up the human capital on, on the female side of the ledger, and then uh, brought them into the economy and gave them the autonomy necessary to do that in a way that is not true of a lot of other parts of the world. And then as a result, you had a huge increase in uh, the formal labor force, in productivity, you had uh, reduced and delayed childbearing, and you had this incredible economic boom that has transformed Asia. And that is very much about using the female half of the population wisely in a way that other parts of the world uh, have been much slower to accomplish. And that was something that I think very much shaped our ideas about the opportunity side of Half the Sky. I, I would just add one more thing to that in terms of um, it's not just education. It is also bringing women into the formal labor force because live, after living in Japan, um, I met so many women who were super educated and yet there's still a problem in Japan. And that's because the, as a society, they wouldn't bring them into the formal labor force. So I think that's an, another critical element. I think the one thing that I've learned in terms of um, the travels around the world is that <clears throat> um, any challenge that I face does not compare with the challenges that these young women who I've encountered and so, um, and who have striven, if, if they've been lucky enough to, to, you know, surpass the problem or trying to. So that to me is, um, is something that I carry with me all the time. You know, whenever I'm getting ready to interview somebody who is supposedly powerful and all that, I'll just remember about all of those younger women and the women and the moms who I meet, um, whether they're from over overseas or even in this country, one of the things that inspires me a lot is the women who are, um, for example, taking care of wounded warrior soldiers who are now going to be sent off to Afghanistan and we're going to have, you know, another wave of these soldiers um, coming back who are wounded and, um, and the mothers and the, the wives of these men or some of them soldiers are women. Um, but I think allowing yourself to be humble is central. Allowing yourself to be humble, which is the point that you were getting at. We think in this country like we know it all. And it's like, no, <laughs> no. We can learn. We can absolutely learn. Bill, we'll start with you as you wrap up. You give your thoughts that you wanted to, and then you can end by saying something that you would like all of us to take that we can do, that we are empowered enough to do to ch take on this issue. I will be very quick. I okay. wanted to respond to this and then you for can... one second. Uh, uh, we have about 2,700 Ashoka Fellows. 52% of them have changed national policy within five years. Uh, they're all people from all over the world who just gave themselves permission. And then they were very smart and persistent. And you know, I, I have great faith. Uh, about 40% of them are women. Uh, Jim's point about uh, the use of the media in all its forms. Uh, used to be street drama and that whole methodology and it's telenovelas and so on. There's enormous creativity. And the power in looking at each one of those insights, each in itself very powerful, and seeing what are the patterns that cut across it. And then us working together to tip the world with the one or two insights that are really most critical for the field. The power of doing that has not been done before. We're just learning how to do it. What I've been saying about young children and adolescents comes out of the work of 500 Ashoka Fellows, um, including our colleague here, um, who, uh, and, and each one of them has basically, when you put it together, you s the, the central insight is Learning knowledge is not enough. If you don't master these social skills, you're out of the game and you can't use the knowledge. 
That's a very simple but very radical transformation of the definition of what education is about. Now, each of the areas, how do you deal with corruption? Well, who suffers from corruption? Of course, it's the weakest people and, and the people who can't play in the economy. It's the same thing, the point we were making earlier. So I, 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 I think your, your question points to uh, the ultimate answer. It's us, if we give ourselves permission and we give everyone the power so that they take permission. That means they've got to have these skills, they've got to know they have these skills, and we've got to change how all the institutions work to make that easy, and that's really what we're doing. That, I mean, that's our task. And so what can we all do here? You think about the specifics we've been talking about. Yeah, the problems are big, but the actions we can take immediately. You know, if you can help one young girl be powerful, What's that going to lead to? Uh, my last story is a, it's a Rajasthani lawyer. It's the only, she was the first woman lawyer in Rajasthan. There was a, a, a widow burning, attended by about 40,000 people, police keeping order. Uh, she said, no, no, this is not good, and brought it to court. Um, the day of the court, there were people with spears and swords, and she was the only person who had the courage to actually go into the court. Ultimately, the national parliament passed a law saying no one can be a public official for five years after their, I mean, I, frankly, I think I would have done something more dramatic, but nonetheless. Now, what was the, the root here was that her grandfather was a member of the Brahmo Samaj, a, a Protestant form of Hinduism who believed that women should be treated equally. And that seed ultimately had a huge impact. Everyone here, if you care about any young girl, you can give her that power. And we can work to ship, change of schools, youth culture. There's no one here who can't do that. Diana. Well, every day in our work, we see um, just, again, the power of the individual. There, wherever there are human rights violations, there are extraordinary individuals <coughs> who fight against those human rights violations. And sometimes they have nothing but a tree under which they go every day and start talking to their villager, to their co-villagers, uh, and then start an organization, and then change laws, and change the negative aspects of their culture. And our responsibility is to find that person, um, either through one of our organizations or any other organization that, that, that Nick and Cheryl have put in their books. But, but I think that is our, as people who have access, I think that is what we have to do is really say, this is what I can do. Maybe I can just send a fax. Maybe I can just write a check. Maybe I can just call my representative and ask w what happens. Or maybe I can just support that person and, and ensure that a law is passed or repealed if it's discriminatory. And that's all within our reach. But I do think that, there, that we have, in, I think what I, just to echo what everybody else has been saying is that the tipping point is, is here. I mean, when you think of where we were as American women 100 years ago, when we couldn't go to medical school, we couldn't purchase property without our husband's permission, we couldn't vote. And now look at this. So I think this really gives us a lot of hope. And, and we are going in the right direction. And, and I salute the grassroots movement around the world who's really been educating us and inspiring us to follow their lead. I would say tell five friends about this issue uh, and spread the word. Or uh, you can go to halftheskymovement.org and mm -hmm. choose um, an organization to help sponsor a girl or go to the Oprah's, web Oprah's website and help sponsor a girl. Anna? Yes, almost by definition, you, well, I know that you are all committed already and that you are all uh, vested and interested in the issues we are discussing. So my recommendation would be stay as committed as you are today, stay informed, be active, uh, seize the opportunities. Uh, we can help you with that. Uh, if you go to our website that you have on your brochure, uh, you can sign up to our uh, newsletter called Connect that will let you know whenever something happens that needs your voice, uh, either that you can make heard either by sending a letter to your a representative or a, to a, a, a newspaper or to another media outlet. So make yourself heard. 
and uh, whenever you are ready and willing support an organization that has the connections that has the presence in the countries uh, where the needs are m direst and uh, through that kind of support you'll achieve a big impact um, yeah, get engaged and don't make it just a matter of writing checks. I mean, that's important, but it's also a little bit easy. And uh, I think it's also important to get engaged in some way. And one of the things that struck Cheryl me so much in writing the book was how often we came across people who started out thinking that, well, I'm so busy, I've got all this to do, but oh, okay, this is really the right thing to do. And they volunteered for something. And then gradually, they just found it so fulfilling and so rewarding. And in particular, we wrote about a bunch of women in Connecticut who ended up sponsoring a hospital in Somaliland, a maternity hospital. And it just ended up being the best thing that ever happened to them. So often, we found that. And likewise, don't you know, psych yourselves out because these problems are so big and because the, the, the improvements come at the margins. And if I can just leave you with this utterly hokey story, which I'm almost embarrassed to, to tell because it is so hokey, but it, it does kind of resonate with me in terms of the kinds of things I see. And that is, it's about the little boy who's walking along the beach in Hawaii, and all the starfish have, have washed up, and so he's throwing them back in. And a, a man comes up and says, what are you doing? I mean, there are zillions of starfish. You can't make a difference. Well, he throws them back and says, well, Sure made a difference to that one. <laughs> I already told you what I think, so I just want to thank you all for coming. It's great to have you here, and, um, and thanks so much to all the panelists and for all the work that you all are doing for you.